Hello and good evening. My name is uh, Benil Richards and I'm the Collection Officer at Maystone Museum and I'm very excited to um, invite you all and welcome you all to our very, very first live talk this evening. And um, so I hope you will um, appreciate that we're all sort of learning at the moment. This is our very first online talk. Before I start introducing our presenter, I will go through some of the technical things. First of all, um, the thing that is most likely to go wrong is um, if uh, we have problems with the connection. If you as an audience member uh, drop out, please don't panic. Go back to your email and rejoin the talk uh, via the link again. If one of the presenters or the producer um, drops out, um, then please stay with us and we will come back as soon as we possibly can. Um, all of you participants are muted, so we can't hear you. And that's because um, that stops any background noise from feeding into the presentation so um, we can hear the speaker well. At the end of the session, there's going to be um, a Q&A session. Um, obviously, as you can't ask the questions verbally, uh, we would ask you to use the Q&A feature. It's a little speech bubble with a question mark on. Uh, the, the platform we're on is Microsoft Teams, so you might have to hunt for the icon a little bit. I would suggest that you do this now. And, and try and see if you can find it. Um, also, our moderator, Samantha Harris, has put a greeting uh, in the Q&A box for you. Um, and during the presentation, we would encourage you to put the questions into the Q&A box when you think of them, and then we will go through as many as we can at the end. Um, the reason why we'd like you to do that rather than wait to the end is that we have found that sometimes there's a bit of a delay on the uh, messages coming through. So just to make sure we get as many questions as possible answered, if you would um, if you would pop them into the Q&A box early, please. Um, if for some reason the question doesn't come through in the in the Q&A and you you will have got um, sort of something that you would really like answering, uh, we do have the option uh, for you to email uh, our collections email at Maidstone. It is collections at maidstone.gov.uk. So that's collections at maidstone.gov.uk and we'll do our best to get back to you. The event tonight is being recorded just to let you know that. Um, so um, we've got the opportunity um, for watching the talk again later. So I'm going to um, introduce our speaker tonight. It's Dr. Sophia Adams, who is a research associate at the University of Glasgow. And her research focuses on the Bronze and Iron Ages in Northwest Europe, particularly on metalwork metalworking and dating. And she's based here in Kent, where she began her archaeological career in the 1990s, volunteering on local sites before she was heading off to university. So tonight she's going to give us a really exciting talk on conservation and research in action um, on the Bolton Mallaby Horde, which um, is currently being um, conserved at uh, Dana Goodburn Brown Conservation. So just very briefly, I know we've got quite a mixed audience here tonight. Uh, some of you will know quite a lot about this hoard already, and some of you might be new to it. Um, the Borton Mallaby hoard was found in 2011 near um, the village of the same name, and it was reported through the Portable Antiquity Scheme. And it's a very large hoard and a very exciting one. And we were very fortunate at the museum to acquire it in 2014 after a large fundraising effort where we had lots of generous supporters, um, including the parishioners of Bolton Mallaby, the William and Edith Oldham Trust, the Art Fund, the Headley Trust and the Victoria and Albert Purchase Grant Trust. So this conservation project is sort of leading on to from work that Dr Adams have been uh, undertaking at the museum beforehand. Um, and uh, we're very excited to um, uh, be able to take part in this. And um, it's been generously, uh, generously supported by the William and Edith Oldham Trust. So um, without sort of further ado, I'll hand over to uh, Sophia, who will tell you more about the past, present and future of a Bronze Age ward. 
Thank you, Peniel, and hello and welcome to everybody. Um, thank you to Maystone Museum for hosting this evening. Um, thank you to the William and Edith Oldham Charitable Trust for supporting our latest research on the Boughton Mallaby Horde. And thank you to Dana Goodburn Brown, whose uh, conservation work will be appearing um, in this talk. It'll make up a large part of it. So as Peniel has kindly mentioned, um, well, actually, until this week, I was a um, research associate at the University of Glasgow. And sadly, my contract has come to an end. But fortunately, I maintain honorary status there for the time being. Um, if you want to ask me any questions direct as well, I've put my email address up on the slides and the Glasgow email address does still keep going for a few years. So don't worry about sending me one to those. It still works. Right. I want to just check. Do we have the PowerPoint showing? Are we ready with that? Yep. OK, um, so it's difficult for me to tell quite what's visible to all of you. So I'm hoping that you can all see our first slide. So as Peniel has pointed out, we have quite a mixed audience tonight. So I'm going to give you a sort of background to the hoard and the period that I'm talking about. And then we'll work through our conservation work and um, the research that we're doing, some of the questions that are coming up. Uh, possibly some answers and then hopefully we'll have some questions from you all at the end. So this timeline here um, is a very simple view of where the Bronze Age sits in relation to what went before the Neolithic period when we get our first farming in Britain. These dates are focused very much on southern Britain. Um, some of you may prefer the Iron Age to begin at 700, some 800. There's a lot of debates but these are the dates I am using today. And it's the late Bronze Age in particular that we're focusing upon. So this is when the hoard is currently dated to. Now, as Peniel has said, it's a massive hoard. Um, unlike the rest of us during lockdown, though, it's getting lighter. So it did start at just over 64 kilos. It's now down to about 63 kilos um, through the conservation cleaning work. Um, it may lose a little bit more, but probably not too much. In terms of weight, it's one of the largest in um, England, certainly for the period. In terms of objects, there's now a recent find from Havering in Essex that has more objects, but that's in four groups of, of objects, whereas the Bortom Mallaby hoard was found as one group in a single pit. The picture on the left, you can see it laid out just after it was reported to the Fines Liaison Officer and laid out at Kent County Council. And the picture on the right shows some of the axes from the hoard. Now, axes are going to feature quite prominently in the talk today, um, and that's because this has been the starting point for our conservation work. Whole ob objects are included in the hoard, but pieces dominate. Um, again, that's typical for these kind of late Bronze Age hoards. In terms of objects, well, we have ingots, bun ingots as they're known. This item in green is your copper ingot there, so that's your pure copper. The item in brown is one example of my baking. I thought it would uh, show you all just what I've been achieving during lockdown. Yes, that should have been a lovely tasty loaf, but it was a great big dense thing, just like a bun ingot. I couldn't resist taking a picture of that. So that isn't an ingot. We also have in the hoard, we have pieces of ingots, we have moulds, so we have bronze moulds which are for casting bronze axes um, and we can confirm from past experimental research that it is definitely possible and current experimental research that it's definitely possible to cast a bronze axe in a bronze mould. We have casting waste, so these are the bits that are chopped off um, when you've cast your objects or puddles of bronze that have missed um, pouring into the mould. Um, we have objects where um, the casting has failed and they've been put in the in the collection. We have bits of bracelets, we have decorative strap fittings. Um, this item down at the bottom is known as a bugle shaped object because it's bugle shaped, possibly some form of, of a strap fitting. Um, we have plates, um, decorated plates, we have weapons, parts of swords. We don't have any complete swords, it's exceptionally rare for a complete sword to end up in a hoard context, they tend to be in pieces. Um, we have spearheads, some complete, some in pieces. 
Um, and we have various tools. Axes, again, dominate the assemblage. We have over 100 axes, um, of which um, just under half, I say, were um, no, actually probably more like a quarter are complete or as close to complete as they can be. Um, other tools, we have gouges, hammers, various bits and pieces. So what are the contexts? Well, we're here down in the southeast of England in Kent. Um, now, this slide here shows data that's been kindly um, lent to me by Ed Caswell um, and John Smythe on the distribution of settlements, contemporary settlements in the late Bronze Age and burial sites and hordes. So the hordes are the triangles. So what we're looking at is this area here, the highlighted area. So the most southern of those is the Bort and Mallaby Horde. Nearby you have two hordes from Lenham and to the northwest is the Hollingbourne Horde, which we have also received some funding from the William and Edith Oldham Trust to analyse that horde as well. So we'll, that will be research to follow. Now you may notice that the hordes on the whole are located away from the settlements, except in Thanet, which is in your northeast corner, where you have hordes, burials and everything. They were well into their Bronze Age activity. Um, part of the distribution reflects um, excavation strategies and also um, metal detecting strategies. So metal detecting research tends to go on in rural locations excavations are more along the lines of roadways and in um, development in towns. As Peniel has mentioned, the hoard was discovered in the um, by metal detecting in 2011. Oh, it's not unusual to have a late Bronze Age hoard, particularly in the southeast. As you can see here on this slide, I've taken a very quick grab of the data from the Portable Antiquities Scheme. So it's not a perfect record of the hordes in the country, but you can get an idea that definitely in the southeast we have a lot of groups, assemblages of Bronze Age objects that can be classed as hordes. So this is all the Bronze Age. And then in the more detailed map here, these are all late Bronze Age metalwork hordes. We have two main phases, the Wilburton phase, which is the earlier part of the late Bronze Age, and the Ewart Park phase, which is the later part. part. And again, most of our hordes are confined to this Ewart Park phase, but we've had some really fantastic finds in Kent recently from Wilburton periods, such as at Battlesmere. There were lots of pieces of plate squeezed into a pot, um, which Keith Parfit and um, Kent Archaeological Society and Canterbury Archaeological Trust for excavating. You'll also see in this slide different types of hoard. So the Borton Mallaby hoard counts as a mixed object hoard. It has various objects I mentioned and pieces. Um, others of the hoards are predominantly ingots or pieces of ingots. Um, very rarely you get ones like the one up in Darrenth, which has just spears. That's two spears. That's a little bit of an oddity. Um, you occasionally get ones that are only axes or you get axes and ingots. Axes are a really big thing in the Bronze Age. So as the presentation title mentioned, that past, present and future work, well, past work you can read for yourself. Um, Kent Archaeological Society have put my article on the Bronze Age Hoard um, available on their website now, which is published a couple of years ago. And this shows you how far we've got with our research on the hoard so far. We were able to identify it um, with the support of the Portable Antiquities Scheme and Brendan O'Connor, who has been a massive help in my metalwork research, um, as a hoard from the Tarps Carp's Tongue Complex. So these are hoards that contain a type of sword called a carp's tongue sword based on the shape of it. It goes very narrow at the end, at the tip of the blade. Um, I'm not familiar with what a carp's tongue looks like, um, but apparently I'm not sure they even have them, but this is the name that has stuck. Um, so this places it quite late in the Bronze Age. We, we date the hoards generally by the style of the objects and the most recent object in the hoard will give the date for the hoard. So there are some older things. We have some things called palstave axes, which is a very simple kind of axe. But we also have these more recent um, cartstone swords, socketed axes, 
end winged axis. So what about the finding of it? Now, um, I always imagine that when they're out detecting for this hoard, it must have given the most massive beep when the detector went over it because of the amount of metal. Apparently it didn't. Um, I had this vision of, sort of Wayne and Nick leaping off the ground as they, as they hit, hit this jackpot. Um, it's really quite shallow. The base of the pit that it sits in is only 42 centimetres below the top of the topsoil. Now we don't have the full detail of how the objects were within the pit. We know um, from this photograph here that the finders have generously shared um, that the ingots were lying at the top. Now if I do the next slide, this shows the bottom of the pit um, as it was excavated by the archaeological team from Kent County Council who came and found one last little piece of metal sitting in the bottom of the pit so they could confirm it was definitely the, where the hoard was found because that one little piece of metal you might be able to see sitting there in the pit is actually the middle part of the decorated plate at the bottom there which had been folded in half before being put in the ground. So we had these ingots at the top and we have our folded metal plate towards the bottom. Below the ingots, we seem to have the red dotted circles there showing the position of some of the ingots. Below those, we have axes and then saw pieces tend to be further down in the pit. But the whole pit itself was potentially only about 20 centimetres or so deep and less than a metre wide. So they were really densely packed in. I always imagine it'd be great fun to do 3D prints of everything that was in the hoard and then to have a go at trying to fit it into that pit space but I think it could give you rather a headache. So what have we been doing now? Well, I'm going to confuse you here with this slide, a Zoom within a Microsoft Teams display as people and people head explode. So we are working within the confines of COVID restrictions. Um, sadly, the project started in March 2020. Fortunately, we've had a real lot of help from Peniel and the rest of the team at Maystone Museum, gathering together the art artefacts to send as batches to Dana to work on with her assistant, Marie Lasso. Um, unfortunately, Marie can't do any of the work right now because the restrictions are even greater. Um, and then where possible, we've had Zoom meetings to chat about the finds, look at them, talk about the research that's going on. And again, this is all supported by the William and Edith Oldham Charitable Trust. But, but why conservation? Why for the next bit of research am I starting with this? Well, for a start, the objects are dirty. When they're excavated, um, when they're handed over to the Treasure Committee, the aim is for the objects to be interfered with as little as possible before they're valued. So this slide here shows you the state of the axes before we start the conservation work. The museum have stored them fantastically well in a dehumidified environment, which has kept them very dry, so that has halted any corrosion. But when they're dirty, you can't see all the details. And as you can see, some of them have got quite bright green patches on them, so there's the potential that there is corrosion that could damage the objects in future. So the conservation is twofold, really. One is to make sure the objects are stable and if not st stabilise them. And the other is to actually clean them and study them so we can see the detail of these finds. So this is an end winged axe. You may hear me refer to today as end winged and socketed axe, axes. End winged ones literally have wings that fold over at the end to hold the axe onto the wooden handle. So if you imagine the wooden handle, this, my hand is a wooden handle and the axe sits around it. I'm hoping you can see me, I'm rather tiny on your screen right now. Whereas the socketed axe, the handle sits into the socket. Very simple. Um, the end winged axes are often referred to as a French object. They're certainly more frequently found in France, although until recently, and they're becoming far more frequent finds in hordes that have been discovered in the southeast. We're getting tens of hordes from just the late Bronze Age in Southeast England every year. And this is rapidly altering our, our understanding. It's also interesting that 
even though they're found in hordes in France, northern France, Brittany, Normandy, they still make up on the whole a slightly smaller component of the horde than the socketed axes. So I think the situation as to where things are made and where they're moved to is rather complex. What we do know looking at the hordes on either side of the channel is there was definitely a very close relationship between practices of deposition and making and tools of use and tools of fighting during the Bronze Age. So this axe here shows you how it looks afterwards. This picture shows you the axe afterwards. And what we can start to pick out is the shape of the, the axe in detail. We can look at the cutting edge. So that's the bottom part of the screen. That's your blade. We can see that this has had some damage. Um, and as we zoom into it, we can look at details about how they're made, how they're used. The objects were all x-rayed before the conservation work was undertaken. This gives us a preview of issues that we might discover. Um, it also shows us some fantastic information about the, the condition of the objects, the way they were cast, um, the way they were treated. So if you look at these x-rays here, I've got the end winged axe on the left, and you can see it's rather porous, the x-ray towards the middle of the axe. There's lots of holes in it, whereas towards the blade end, it isn't. And this is partly to do with polishing the blade, which, which evens out those porous elements, um, and also partly to do with the casting. They're cast from the, the top down. So um, the mould, you have a two valve mould, generally, the moulds that we are finding are bronze, but you also can get stone moulds, you can get clay moulds. So you have two part moulds tied together and then the, the molten bronze, which is a combination of copper and tin, and by our analyses on these, about 80 to 85 percent copper. The remainder tin and other trace elements. Um, and this is poured into the top of your mould and then your axe is cast and then you need to remove um, casting flashes, so bits where the, the metal sort of squeezed out the sides afterwards. You can see in socketed axe 150 there's a slight crack showing up um, and potentially that's a crack that occurred during use or maybe even during casting but it wasn't enough to stop it being used. You can see the blade on that one is splayed out slightly and that's from repeated um, sharpening, so, so um, working of the edges and it starts to splay out the metal slightly. Repeated sharpening suggests repeated use. So what methods are we doing? In a way it's relatively simple but it requires immense patience, immense skill, immense de dexterity. So we start after we've x-rayed the objects um, and assess the condition of them. We start with swabbing and brushing. So this would be using solvents and very carefully. Um, some of you may be familiar with swabbing in a very different way at the moment doing your COVID tests, but in a way it's rather similar. You get, you know, your soft bud like, like you put down your throat and you gently swab at the object. Once this has been carried out, then move on to mechanical cleaning. So this is cleaning by hand, but the vital part here is to have the object under the microscope while you're doing that. That. So you have high magnification. Um, you want to have high magnification so that you can actually see what you're doing, see if the dirt is actually dirt, um, how it's adhered to the object. Scalpels are used, which, which sounds dangerous really to have a sharp metal implement against um, the metal. You don't want to scratch it, but there's two ways this works well. One is that firstly the the conservators have great dexterity, so they're very careful with their hands. Um, the other is that if the scalpel did cut the object, it would be such an obvious mark, it'd be very different to the kind of tool marks that we actually find and the use wear marks that we find on the objects. So it would show up the difference. But again, Dana and Marie are so skilled and I've looked at these objects all very carefully after their work and I've not seen any sign of slippage. We also have, following mechanical cleaning, move on to um, bathing them in a corrosion inhibitor. So this is once your object is clean, then you want to stop it getting worse, getting corroded, you know, disintegrating. Um, some of the objects have 
what Dana likes to call warts on them, where the corrosion has formed a big lump and an assessment has to be made as to how much of that to remove. You don't want to create a big dent in the object, um, but you also want to make sure you've removed active corrosion. So again, this is another decision that's taken in the process. But once you've got to the stage where you're happy, you've done as far as you need to go, um, then it's placed in corrosion inhibitor. What we're not doing with these objects is lacquering them in any way afterwards. So there's nothing coating them that isn't reversible. Um, it also means that we can really look at the fine details under the microscope as we research them. But it makes it even more important that we wear our nitrile gloves or latex gloves while we're handling these objects because we don't want to remove that very fine corrosion inhibitor and we don't want to start our objects corroding again. And then they will be stored back in a desiccated environment. So back they go with a nice COVID safe handover to the um, Maystone Museum into the dehumidified store. Some of our objects have been slightly more complicated. We have this amazing one here, this socketed axe, which contained a gouge. So a gouge, again, a socketed item, very rounded with a curved end, um, used for woodworking, so for literally gouging out the wood. And we found it shoved into this axe. Now, if you look at the X-ray in the middle there, you'll see two objects with something inside. Number 176 is the base of an axe, so that's the blade. It's broken before deposition, so the rest of the axe is mi missing. But there's a little piece shoved into the socket. That one actually turned out to be the piece wasn't pushed in, it had fallen in, perhaps during the gathering the items to put into the ground in the pit, so that was very loose in it. Whereas the gouge was much more firmly stuck in there and Dana had to carefully pick away, as you can see in the picture here, at the dirt to check that it was actually not just fused in place, it was definitely pushed in. This is quite an interesting axe as well because of the decoration on it. You can see you've got this kind of wing shapes and it's almost like the axe has been squeezed. Normally the wing shapes don't push the, the fr front of the body of the axe out in this way. Um, it doesn't seem to be distorted by the gouge going in it, so it's definitely a design feature. And also on this axe, you'll notice the blade. It has a chunk missing. And we found this on a number of the objects where Potentially they've hit something really hard accidentally. Um, but as Damien will tell you, you don't want to accidentally hit something really hard with your fantastic woodworking tools. Damien being Dana's partner, um, who is a woodworking specialist. You want to look after them. So it's quite possible that some of this damage is intentional breakage of the blade. Not all our objects are damaged. Um, some have very little damage on them. We have some axes like these two here, which have barely been used at all. You can see the casting seams down the sides of the axes with the loops there that attach them to the wooden haft. Um, you can see the blade is fairly straight. It isn't splayed. There's a little bit of damage on it, um, but not wholly so. We have this example. You have to get the lights right for this one. I'm rather pleased you can see it now in the picture, but you might be able to see the striations across the tip of the blade there. And this shows evidence of what we think is sharpening the axe. Now, if you want to get those nice neat striations, it's probable that you actually lay your stone that you're sharpening against down on the ground and then rub your axe across it. Um, we've seen this mark, these marks on a lot of the axes, but this one is one of the most distinctive. And if you look very closely at the tip of it, you might be able to even see some slight lines coming the opposite way. And these are the use wear marks. If I move to the next slide, it's maybe a little bit more obvious here. So you've got, we've turned the axe around now, so this is another axe turned around the other way. And you can see your horizontal lines from where it's been polished and sharpened. And then you can see your vertical lines coming from the tip of the blade up towards the socket. And these are the marks that we think are occurring when you're chopping the wood. As Damien suggested, quite possibly 
um, wood that's got maybe sand or some, something grainy on it so that when you chop into it, it, it creates these little striations. Again, this is an axe that's been damaged on the corners, possibly through use. It's not as blatant as some of the others where the damage seems to be really intentional. And again, here under the microscope, you can see these this layering of the of the um, use wear and the polishing marks and the um, sharpening marks. Now, it's interesting here that you get the stratigraphy. Those of you who are familiar with field work will be familiar with archaeological stratigraphy, the layers through time. And we get stratigraphy in our objects where we can see which mark was made first. So on the right, um, you can see from the tip, which is on the right hand side of the screen, you have lines going one way and then the more frequently grouped lines going top to bottom. Those go underneath the ones that are coming from the tip. So it shows that they were there first and then the ones from the tip after, which, which again confirms our idea that these are sharpening, um, polishing marks, and then the others are use wear marks. Um, when I was talking earlier about the warts that are found on the axes, um, here's some nice examples on the left of the issues with these bright green warts. But again, we can see those sitting over the mark, so we know that this isn't later damage. This isn't post-excavation damage, this is damage to the axes before they were buried. So we have our used tools, we have our end-winged axes that have been used, we have an ads, we have our um, intentional damage to some of them. We are missing one main part though of these axes and of a lot of the tools and weapons in the hoard and that's the wooden element. So we're only getting the metal parts buried, the axe head as opposed to the entire axe. Um, Damien has kindly shared with us here some examples of his axes. So Damien, um, for those of you who don't know, does a lot of um, reproductions um, and experiments of working with um, wood in the Bronze Age method. So we have the Dover boat. He was part of the team that recreated the Dover boat, which is a Bronze Age boat. Um, and because he uses the axes, we can ask somebody who uses the axes how they would have worked, how you would look after them. Um, Damien reminds us again and again to be very careful with these blades because drop them accidentally and you damage the edge. So the other thing we're probably missing is the um, kind of bags or leather coverings or something like that that they would have used to cover their axes. Um, potentially for while they're carrying them about. And when you look at some of the bronze moulds, um, you actually find decoration on the outside. And there's one example, I'm afraid I don't have a picture here, but there's one example where the decoration has lots of lines across it, almost looking like something tied around the mould. And it's possible that that's representing what the casing, the wooden, um, sorry, leather casing would have looked like around the axe with string tied around it. So I mentioned gouges earlier. This is the end of a gouge, again, slightly damaged um, and broken in half. Now this breakage I'm going to come back to you later on. And the ads. So this is Damien's favourite object. These are really quite rare to find, not only an ads, but an end winged ads. And the difference here is that it gets hafted in the opposite direction to the axes. So if you look at the axes on the left, you can see that the blade runs top to bottom, but on an adze, the blade would run horizontally so you can chop into the wood. So this is a great tool that we're definitely going to have a go at replicating that and give Damien a chance to work with it. So Lynn mentioned, some of you may have picked this up in her email, that we have a very special news flash coming up in this hoard. Now, something I'd hoped for, but didn't really expect to find, has appeared in this hoard. So we're looking here at axe number 150, this is our socketed axes. There's it after conservation. And we look inside the socket of axe 150. This is again during conservation. The little ridge that you can see running down inside the socket there, 
These are often called hafting ribs, though I suspect they also had um, a function potentially to help with the casting. They certainly would have been created the shape by the core that would have been put in the mould to, to create the socket shape when casting. Now inside the socketed axe, as we go further in, we have da, 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 a tiny piece of organic material. It's really tiny, it's only a couple of centimetres wide, but it is absolutely exciting for us because this shows one of the key values of our conservation work in cleaning these finds carefully, that we can find an organic object. By organic, I mean something that would normally decompose plant fibres we have here. And this has been preserved because it was packed so tightly into the bottom of the socket. And then the objects have been stored in a fairly anaerobic environment, so with a lack of oxygen. And then since they've been excavated, they've been kept in this nice dry environment. So what is it? Well, I've been talking to Susanna Harris, who's um, a specialist in uh, prehistoric textiles, who studied all the collection from Must Farm. And she suggests it could be bast fibre, which is the fibres you get from plants and trees below the bark. Um, and this in the Bronze Age is, is frequently used in a number of purposes. Potentially what we, th what we think we have, looking by the way that this tiny thing is squidged. And if we think back to our axe, our axe was actually quite big compared to some of them. We think what we've got is an axe handle that didn't fit properly. And we have a Bronze Age person stuffing the end of that socket with their um, plant fibres so that the haft would fit a bit better. Perhaps they just hadn't got the quite the right bit of wood cut down. The spur, the part sticking out at the end of the handle, wasn't quite long enough, so they packed it in there. So we've got this lovely human element. Now these bast fibres, um, as I was saying, they're used in the Bronze Age for textiles. Um, linen, for example. Uh, we also get nettle fibre textiles, you've got all sorts of, of plant textiles, but they're also used in metalworking. So here we have remains of clay moulds. Um, these examples have come from Maxi Quarry in Cambridgeshire. Um, they're moulds for making slightly earlier spearheads, so they're from the um, Middle Bronze Age. But you have two layers in your clay mould. You have an inner valve, an inner layer that's all smooth clay, and then that's two parts of your valves. You join them together, you tie it up with your bast, your, it's basically your Bronze Age string, and then you coat it with a, a rougher layer of clay to hold it all together while you then pour the metal in and cast the object. So the one in the middle shows you the two layers separated looking at the outside, and you should be able to see the impressions of the bast in those pieces of clay. So we've got a bit of textile, we've got beautifully decorated objects, um, we're get gradually gathering together information about how they're made. So the decorative plaque, I'm rather in love with this piece because it was found, it was buried, bent, you can actually rejoin it almost completely. There's a couple of tiny pieces missing, but even that tiny fragment was retained down at the bottom of the screen, so you can put them all back together. So you've got that action of bending over, maybe even potentially having to heat it a bit to bend it, and burying in the ground. And if we look at it from the side view, our latest question that's coming up is how it was cast and how the holes were made. Now in swords at the time, they generally cast the holes as little indentations, the holes for the rivets, and then punch them through afterwards. So that would suggest if we look at this picture from the side that we've got the punch through metal, but then it's quite rounded. So potentially that's actually the um, original shape. Are we looking here at evidence perhaps for some kind of wax casting, lost wax casting? It's certainly possible at this time. We have these button-like objects. Um, they're quite tiny. The one in the middle, the shiniest one at the back there, is one of the thickest, the heaviest, and it has a loop on the back. And looking under that, uh, that under the microscope, we have this 
dendritic structure appears. So you might be able to see the sort of what I think of as palm fronds there in the structure. And this shows that it was cast as opposed to being beaten out metal sheet. And the structure forms because the different metals, the different elements within our bronze cool at slightly different rates, you get this structure coming up. So these are other exciting bits of information that we're able to extract as we look at these conserved finds. Some of you may have heard these hoards referred to as founders hoards, um, suggestion that they're collections of objects gathered together by metal workers um, for their foundries, um, stored ready to melt again. Certainly we have a variety of evidence to show that in Kemp we had metal workers at this time. Um, and using all sorts of different methods for casting in clay, well, similar methods, but different materials, casting in clay moulds or casting in bronze moulds. Um, at Borton Malaby, we have our, our moulds for casting end wing axes, although only one valve is complete. Um, Holbrook Quarry, we have slightly earlier moulds for casting swords. At Mill Hill Deal, we have a tiny bit of mould for casting a ring decorated object, a flat one, potentially like this plaque piece again from the hoard down at the bottom. And then from Ar Harty, the Isle of Harty hoard, which is now in the Ashmolean Museum, you have moulds for casting gouges and for casting axes. I'm afraid that picture on the right slightly has distorted on the image there, so your axe looks a little bit more squat than it is. But we even have the axes that were cast in the mould buried in that hoard. And the picture on the left here shows just part of that hoard. Um, with various tools. So that horse seems to be far more connected with metalworking in terms of it having the, the tools, um, the moulds, but then some of the tools have been used. So it's not wholly, um, they're not wholly just making things and putting them in the ground. They're not just collecting up used objects because some of them are freshly cast and then buried. It seems to be quite complex. Um, the Beck Hoard on the right here from Minnis Bay, um, again this is one I've been looking at the British Museum, this gives you this idea of the kind of collections of material that's coming up in these mixed hoards. Again we have bracelets, bits of swords, axes. Is it possible that our collections in these mixed hoards are just representing the artefacts of daily life or general life in the Bronze Age? More people had an axe and used an axe than a sword. So we have less parts of saws, more parts of axes. Was it that things were being intentionally broken? We certainly have um, evidence and research that's been carried out by, for example, um, Matt Knight, where he's identified that some of these items had to be heated before they could be smashed. But once you smash them, hit them hard, they break into very similar shapes that you find in these hordes. So you've got some deliberate smashing or bending. We've got some accidental damage through use. Um, we have this end winged axe here that could we say that it's been killed? They certainly stopped the blades being usable or have they chopped off the blade so that it doesn't cut through the bag when you're carrying your metal ready for recycling? And we have blades that are uh, dented and looks like they've been used for hitting things other than wood. They're not used for their intended purpose. Now, if you imagine the sound of this, I wish I could play you a, a little clip sitting there smashing, breaking, bashing. It's certainly a, a, a very evocative um, idea of what the world was like in the Bronze Age. So at some point, somebody or several people have gathered together almost 64 kilos of metal. Um, I believe that might be 10 stone. Um, do check on that. Um, They've got complete copper ingots, so one of those alone weighs seven kilos. So this is the raw metal ready for making objects. Then they've got axes, some of which have been used, some of which have been purposefully damaged, some of which have been stuffed with things. They've got pieces of 50 what appear to be different swords. They've got bracelets, they've got some bracelets that may have come from um, over in continental Europe. Um, for, um, We've got axes from France, potentially. We've got all these things gathered together. Is it really just somebody storing their metal ready for remelting? Is it a community gathering together? 
if somebody was trying to hide this stuff on their own, would you not notice that they've gone up the hill? Remember, this is placed up on this green sand ridge, um, looking down over the valleys in Kent. Certainly, we have so many questions about how these items were gathered together, how they were made, what they're doing in the ground. And we're getting a little bit of help with this. Um, lunar tractors, who are a fantastic um, ensemble who are creating a piece about the hoard, about how and why potentially it went in the ground. They're looking at the poetry of it, the sounds, the music. So that's something that we're going to be able to share with you, hopefully in June this year, in a, in, ready for the Festival of Archaeology. And we're going to be researching these artefacts when I eventually can get back into a library. I'm going to be able to look at more examples to compare them with and go to other museums and look at their collections. And we're going to carry on our conservation work. We still have a couple of batches left to go. And then in 2023, we'll be exhibiting all the finds and the results at Maystone Museum in a special exhibition. So if you want to follow our work up to then, to then do have a look at the website. And it just leaves me to say thank you ever so much for listening. Thank you to all the people who've researched our uh, help with the research and supported our project. And over to you for questions. Yeah, thank you ever so much. That's absolutely stunning slides and really interesting information, uh, Sophia. And we have got quite a few questions coming in. Uh, Karen is asking about the casts. She uh, got a little bit confused about whether or not um, casts were found with the Borden Mallaby hoard or where you have found evidence of them. Um, so, uh, in the Borton Mallaby hoard, we have moulds and we have the castings from them. So that's the objects. We don't. What we don't have in this hoard is specifically the moulds for casting the objects that are in the hoard. We have moulds that could have cast similar objects, and we have the objects. So we have moulds for casting end winged axes, and we have some end winged axes, but we don't think that they were made by that mould. What we also have is the casting waste, and that is in the hoard. The exception, um, or some, occasionally we get an exception like at the Isle of Harty, where we actually get the moulds and the objects they cast buried together. Um, this occurs in about, I think it's about a quarter of examples of bronze moulds. So bronze moulds, I could do your whole talk about them, but I'm sure we haven't got time this evening. Um, but there's about 60 of them in, in the country, and generally from um, e Eastern England and they're usually occurring in hordes. Um, they don't appear to be buried with um, organic material or buried with the clay remains of metalworking, so they are something treated quite differently and very occasionally we get the things that are cast in them buried with them. Does this answer your question? I hope. <laughs> yeah, Karen, if, um, if you want to pop some more in the Q&A about whether or not that answered your questions, please do. Uh, while we're waiting for that, I'll go on to a question from Gillian. Um, if there's any way of telling how long an axe might have lasted before it had to be, be replaced by a new one. I think that's a really interesting oh, question. Yeah, a brilliant question. Yeah, particularly with those leather pouches. That was a, a new thing for me. Yeah. 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 Um, I would imagine. Um, unfortunately, we can't get Damien on here because he would be the best person to answer it from his experience. But I imagine part of it depends on how well you care for it. Part of it also depends on the quality of the casting. Now, what I didn't show you, but some of the ones particularly where they've been broken, you can actually see that the um, core that was down the centre of the socketed axe wasn't placed quite in the centre. One side is thicker than the other, so they're slightly weak on one side. Um, so I can't answer your question, you know, how many swings of the axe you would get or how many years it would last, but I imagine it's, it's quite variable. Um, potentially, we might be able to get uh, Dana or Damien to answer in the Q&A if we're lucky. Um, yeah, and Gordon is asking, I think this is relating to the axe, whether or not the internal ridge could be for preventing the turnal of the handle in use. 
Yeah, I, I, th I think you, I think that's a very important factor of it. Um, they're frequently they're, they're quite different positions. Um, Dane and I got slightly obsessed with it the, this the other day, looking in the sockets that some of them have um, one ridge on either side. Some of them have four ridges. Some of them have pairs of ridges. Um, but I think it's they've often been called hafting it ridges because of this idea that they would have stopped the axe from slipping round. So you've got that as well as um, the loop that ties allows you to tie the axe onto the handle. Um, but you have to remember that they've also been made into the, sh the shape of the core that goes in the side. So is there possibly an element of it helping the core come out? What we haven't found in any of these sockets is the remains of the clay cores from casting them. So they're definitely very good at clearing those out. And um, from those who've done um, experimental um, casting, they've often found getting the core out of the socket one of the hardest parts. That's fascinating. About um, the fibres that were found, which are very, very exciting. Um, <laughs> Joe is asking if you can carbon date the organic fibres. Oh, yes. So this is our intention. Um, so those of you who may have noticed at the beginning, um, the department I was working in at the University of Glasgow is SUIC, which is where the radiocarbon dating labs are, are based. And they believe that we will be able to radiocarbon date it. Um, so what we're going to do is all the analysis of how the fibres actually look, so we can potentially identify the species. And then we will take a sample for radiocarbon dating. Now, what this will give us is the date at which those plants died. And that will give us a radiocarbon date for the hoard. It won't tell us for certain exactly when the hoard was buried, but it might give us a much um, more precise idea than our stylistic dating methods. So I'm really excited that we're going to, fingers crossed, going to be able to do that. Yeah, that's going to be very exciting. Um, We've got a question here saying whether or not you could, uh, from Anders, if you could say a little bit more about the possible lost wax casting of the plaque. Uh, yes, so well, we're still really early days with the plaque. Um, it's more with the um, nice little, uh, the button sort of like objects that it seems most likely they could have been, um, most likely they could have been. As you can see, we're, we're, I'm not saying definitely, but it seems most probable that these were lost wax casting because of the loops that you get inside. It's, it's one of the simplest ways for being able to create these different multi elements. Um, we certainly have evidence for Bronze Age, um, Middle Bronze Age bracelets on the continents that have been lost wax cast. Um, and there's a great bit of research um, carried out by Mary Lou on um, the casting of these. So. It's possible even some of our bracelets were lost wax casting. Lost wax casting, for those who don't know, is where you make an original of the object, the design of it, in wax. Um, probably beeswax, but it could also be tallow made from animal fat. Then you coat this with clay, allow that to dry, heat it and melt out the wax. So then there's a cavity within the clay that forms the mould for you to cast in your bronze and form your object and then you break off the mould afterwards so the mould is, is damaged. Um, we've also got a question from Mike about where we're finding the various hordes. Is there any pattern uh, in relation to this? Uh, well, there are some suggestions. So um, research by David Yates um, is suggesting that there's a relationship between um, springs and rivers and also between Bronze Age field systems. He suggests potentially they're occurring near the edges of fields. Unfortunately, with Borton Malaby, um, the uh, geophysical survey of the site um, wasn't successful, so we don't know whether there are any other features nearby this particular hoard. Perhaps one day we'll have the opportunity to find out. Um, we haven't had any development nearby to know whether, you know, in the immediate environments there might have been a settlement or so on. In terms of being right next to water, it isn't, um, but you're not far from the, the spring heads we have um, it overlooking the valleys. I think you have to be very careful with this um, relationship with hordes and water, particularly in Kent, because on the whole, we're not too far from rivers. We're not too far from streams. Um, we have some sites like Minnis Bay that are now underwater, but would have been inland, but potentially near a stream. 
Um, it's again, it's something that we want to do more research on, and it seems to be patterns vary in different parts of the country, perhaps based on the local topography and geology. Yeah, and we've got a, a really interesting question uh, here now, something that I find sort of quite interesting about interconnection. Uh, Luna Tretis is asking uh, whether or not we've got any information about where the bronze ingots come from, uh, how far they might have travelled if they come um, away from Kent or whether or not they are, you know, sort of more local. So we don't have any local copper sources at all. Um, I was able to do some analysis as part of the previous funding, um, which we're still processing the results of those, but that was with um, Luis Armada, who's in Spain. And based on the lead isotopes within the copper, um, we were able to identify that some of them are probably coming from um, orderly edge area. So we're talking up towards Manchester. Um, one of them potentially um, has a Mediterranean origin possibly even Sardinia, um, and others of them may be from elsewhere on the continent, but certainly it would be a material that has to be imported. Um, and these river wine and sea routes would have been the best way of transporting this material at the time, rather than trying to get it across land. Yes, it is. Uh, having carried it, it is, I can confirm, it is very heavy, so water transport would definitely be an advantage. Uh, you can tell <laughs> with your experience of carrying it can just uh, <laughs> it be for one person just to drag it up the hill. Or um, the I'm just a beast of burden, yeah. <laughs> uh, we've got another question about whether or not the bun ingots are always found with other items. Uh, no, they're not. Um, but when they're complete, so as the whole ingot, so far they've only been found with other items. So we find bits of them on their own. Um, for example, there was an excavation at um, a school in Surrey, Cranmere School, where you had pieces of the ingots put in a pot and the pot was put in the end of a ditch. Um, that sounds like something it would be quite easy to go back for. Um, but again, nobody has returned for these items. I mean, I didn't mention the numbers of the hordes in Kent from late Bronze Age, but we're looking at maybe about 75 or more hordes. This is a lot of material that's not been gone back for. But yeah, we do get ingot only hordes but those are pieces of ingots. And then we occasionally get these complete ingots. So they're relatively rare to get the complete ones. That's brilliant. Now we've, we've got a very specific one here, which is what is the approximate average weight of the socketed axis? Oh, uh, yeah, I haven't done the average weight. Um, if you bear with me one moment, I can just have a look on my computer and see what um, Wait, so I have got, in fact, I was just weighing some the other day. The fortune of being at home is I have everything on hand. Um, so we're looking, the weights are variable. Some of them are much heavier than others, um, but we have ones that are up to sort of 250 grams. Um, we have others that are closer to 150. Um, one goes over 300 grams. So they they are quite variable. Um, and the types of them, it's something I didn't go into detail because it can get a little bit specialist, but the types of axes that are present, um, some of them are what we call southeastern type, which is not actually southeast England. It's more southeastern um, to uh, northern parts of Europe. Um, but these, these are common type that are found quite widely spread, whereas we have another example that's known as um, a South Welsh, Welsh axe because most of them come from southern Wales, um, although we do have a mould for one in Surrey. Um, and then we have these things called the Meldrith type, based on examples found in um, East Anglia. And those are very nice faceted ones, like the one you saw that had been split. Um, so we have them from a variety of places. Um, it's possible that the weight of them and the star would also help them, help in terms of use. You know, as Damien's pointed out to me, um, you know, we have different shapes of um, axe, uh, of the marks which the axes have made from chopping wood. And you could potentially start working out which kind of axe they were using for which bit of chopping. Which bit of, yeah. So, yeah. 
don't think I've got any more questions coming in right now. We'll give it a few minutes. I hope I haven't missed any. This is all sort of a little bit trying not to miss anything that sort of comes ticking in in the Q&A. So, um, so I'll give it a couple of seconds to hear if we've got any more questions. Otherwise, in terms of just to say what you're thinking about that in terms of the the project we're, we're keen to um when we've gone through the next batches to do another talk um where we can go on to the other details so we can set aside the axes for a while and have a look at um the other evidence that we're discovering um so do follow the museum's um website to keep an eye out for for that event Yes, and we are so excited about, you know, what uh, what is coming out of this. We've got uh, a few more questions rolling in now, actually. We've got Mark is asking, do we think most people owned Axis? I think so. I think based on the percentage, so they tend to make up about 40% of each hoard. Um, so if everyone didn't own one, certainly everyone was very familiar with that as an object compared to swords, which, you know, are, are much rarer items that, although they're parts of them present in the, in the hordes, they're, they're not as common. Um, one suggestion is um, to do with skill, but I think as Damien will tell you, there's quite a skill to using an ax, but you'd have needed axes for chopping down firewood, um, as well as the more complicated woodworking. So I think it would have been a very familiar tool. As, as in terms of the question of ownership, I think that's that's something that we need to explore more with the Bronze Age is, you know, did people have ownership over individual items? Were items personal or was there an aspect of shared ownership? Certainly with my trowel, I like to use my own trowel. It has my own shape. Um, and I'm sure you're all familiar with that with doing your, your field work. So with your axe, you probably want to use your own wax. With your pen, you want to use your own pen as it's got worn. So I think People would have had their own objects, but we don't know a lot about ownership. Yeah. Now we've got another tool related question now. You're going to have to help me. So if it's from Amanda, it's the one tool I can never pronounce correctly. Why are the daisies rare finds? <laughs> oh, I've, I've, lost, I've lost where it is. Where are we? Do, do, do. Amanda. Amanda. Adds it. Yeah. Why are they rare? I don't know. They're, they're just they're just not very often included in the hordes. Um, again, is it perhaps because they're uh, used less or is it because they're something that were saved more? Um, yeah, the why questions are always the really interesting ones and always the hardest ones to answer. They are hard to answer, aren't they? Um, there's also a question about were there any tin ingots found? Yeah, no, we haven't found any tin ingots and those are exceptionally rare. Um, the copper ingots are far more common. Um, tin tends to be the, the things that sort of found in shipwrecks and so on and, and really not occurring. So if you think about it, tin um, sources are even rarer. So really Cornwall's the um, sort of uh, main source of tin for much of the UK and, and Europe. Um, so it would have been a very precious item. Yeah. It seems that, 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 that they weren't, weren't going to be giving that to any gods in the ground or saving it for later or anything. You know, they were using their tin as soon as they had it. <laughs> as soon as they got it. Yeah. Uh, Anne is asking if um, you've got more information written up. Uh, it's possible to see more of the projects. Um, would that be your website that you've got on yeah. the slide? So Yes, yeah, so we haven't got a lot on the website at the moment, but we're getting there. Um, but yes, we're in terms of publishing information. Um, there is the intention to publish it in journals and so on. Um, but do if you want to see as far as we've got, do have a look at the um, article on the Archaeologia Cantiana article on the Kent Archaeological website, sorry, Archaeological Society website. Um, which shows you where we got to before we started this project. And then, yeah, we'll be putting more information on our own um, on the Bronze Age Hordes website. Yeah, and um, I know that my colleague is intending to uh, send an email to attendees at the end of this. So maybe we could include a link to your to your yep. website there. Yep. Um, 
then somebody's got an enterprising mind. Could it be that the late Bronze Age tools are buried to force people to use the new iron tools? Well, the problem is, um, firstly, that based on the dating, we're ahead of most of the iron tools. We are getting iron tools in the Lynn Var phase, which is right at the end of the Bronze Age, potentially um, overlapping with our hoard. But iron tools are still very rare at this time. And a lot of the earliest iron tools are actually quite rubbish. Um, part of the problem is I think that they're, they're trying to work from a tool shape that works for a bronze object to make an iron object like that rather than starting afresh. You know, you're always having to work from the design that you have. Um, there has been ideas in the past that they're trying to take bronze out of circulation. But then if we look at the percentage of objects that are missing from the hoard. So most of our axes have half or more than half missing. Our swords have maybe 80 percent missing. There's a lot of metal that was still in circulation that isn't going in the ground, which suggests potentially selective deposition and also a lot of um, metal or bronze objects that can still be in use. It's re the Iron Age is very slow to get started. There's one suggestion that we almost have a wood age before the Iron Age. And uh, in terms of Iron Age evidence, it's really only around about the fifth century, so 450 BC, where we start getting a lot more finds from the Iron Age. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's a very interesting one here. Uh, do you know whether any of the axes were used by right or left handed people? So this is a question we've asked ourselves, um, particularly when I was looking at the Minnis Bay hoard, we, we were wondering about it because you were getting a, a sort of slope on one side of the axe was more prominent than the other. The difficulty you'd have is working out whether it's to do with being right handed or left handed or how you chop at things. I, I think it would be very difficult to prove. Um, it'd be interesting to know, but then maybe it's maybe it's not culturally relevant. Um, part of our right handed and left handedness um, it's so important these days because of handwriting. But if you haven't got handwriting um, when you're using your tools, you may have a dominant side, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're, you're right handed or left handed. Watch this space. <laughs> yes, that'll be interesting. Yes. Well, I suppose it sort of brings you closer to the person. If you can yeah. imagine what hand they were using the, the tools with, you know, that that's uh, one of the things that sort of it's just that sort of human touch, isn't there? Yeah. Um, I noticed with them. Um, Mat at use. I'm just thinking back to field work. Um, there are certain hands that are dominant. That I think it's the way around I use it would actually be a left hander's use, but I'm I'm very much a right hander. So yeah, it may shift with different tools. It might shift between yes, uh, and some people have mixed dominance as well, yeah. have they? I mean, you can be right-handed and left-footed, for instance. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we've got a question from Peter about relationships. Do you see any relationship uh, with the Horde compared to the Wessex region, particularly Stonehenge and Avebury, etc.? Yeah, so um, obviously Stonehenge and Avebury, as you'll be familiar with, uh, are much earlier than, than our site specifically. Most of the activity there is, is from earlier in the Bronze Age. Um, but in terms of the Horde's character, the Horde, Wiltshire, Wessex, this, this region has very similar kind of hordes. It's only really once you start getting to Dorset that the behaviour gets quite different and they don't get these broken and mixed object hordes in the same way. And then in Cornwall, you, you're getting these mixed ones, but you're not getting as many of them. So there are regional variations. Um, one of the biggest problems with interpretation in um, prehistory in Britain is that Wessex has really dominated the discussion. So everything's been compared and it's only as more research is done on, on the local regions that we start seeing the, the differences. Um, the decorative plaque, which is very beautiful and has been on display in the museum, um, are there at the moment, obviously it's, it's um, we're closed, but um, is the decorative plaque, are there other examples in Kent? Um, now, this is something I need to research more, not that I know of immediately, um, but it doesn't mean that they don't exist. <laughs> um, we, the, one of the other halls I've been looking at recently, so there's Minnis Bay, we don't have any in that, but we do get these really tiny, thin, almost sort of a millimetre thick um, little 
metal tabs that are decorated with that circular raised circular decoration, those concentric rings. Um, we're not entirely sure what those are off. They almost could be something that's attached to clothing. So we've got variations of it. But in terms of this kind of big cast object, again, I don't know, but I'm quite happy to be corrected. Yeah, it's certainly very, um, you know, I've never seen anything like it. It looks very beautiful. Yeah. And um, now, now, there's a slight typo in this one, so I'm not quite sure I'm getting the question right here. Have you got any cast something bronze axes? If so, do they contain any porosity or cracks? I think I think the question is, have you cast any bronze axes? OK, they, have you cast any? Do they contain yeah. porosity or cracks? So I haven't had the opportunity to x-ray any that I've cast, um, and it would be um, really useful to be able to do it. Um, it might be worth us next time we uh, get to x-ray some of the Borsa Malibu hoard, we, we take along some, some replicas afterwards. Um, I hope that there are other people who have, but again, it's an area for research. Um, with all the information that I'm showing you today, we're really very much in the early days of researching all the questions that are coming up, but it's great to see you posing extra questions that I can add to our, our research queries. That's brilliant. Thank you ever so much, Sophie. I don't know whether or not we're ready to wrap up now. Um, I know it's not quite eight o'clock, but uh, oh, hang on, there's more questions coming in here. Um, yeah, somebody saying maybe a lot of the tools were used with both hands at the same time. You get more force that way by hitting at something than by hitting with something with one hand. I think what, what the questions are actually showing is that the even if we can't start answering yet the questions about why the material is ending up in the ground, the the questions that these objects raise are so fascinating, you know, and the the information about how people were um, relating with the world around them in the Bronze Age. Um, there's so much information that can be drawn out of these. You know, for me, these objects are, are a very tangible way of getting in touch with those people in the past. Certainly, yeah. Yeah, I was just looking. I just got a note through saying that we missed Graham's question. It is a similar question about right and left handed use um, and whether or not maybe you could tell it from the where. Yeah, I mean, there's actually surprisingly little um, research published, at least on um, the wear patterns on a lot of these metal objects. Um, so it's something that we, we really want to learn more about. Well, there's a question about whether I'll be able to do talks to other groups. Do get in touch. Absolutely. So it's a lot easier than having to travel out in the cold and dark these days sitting at home. Yes. Um... Do you want me my face on while I'm saying thank you to to Sophia, um, Sam, or should I just do it from behind my screen? I'm quite happy to do it from behind. Neil, my I just one question that I, I I'm not sure I fully answer, which is where they cast nearby. Um, and again, that's something that we can't really answer. Um, we certainly got the potential in the evidence for them being cast nearby but we we don't know and we don't have a metal working site in the immediate vicinity all of these hordes tend not to be at the location where we have evidence for um the actual uh, um sites where they, they seem to be making um that they, they tend to have the sites where you've got actual evidence of the actual metal working occurring at that site tend to be closer to settlements and not near where you're getting the metal hordes deposited Right, I think we're done now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you ever so much for uh, attending tonight and thank you ever so much for all your kind comments in the uh, Q&A. So I'll pass them on to Sophia later on and I thoroughly concur. It has been, um, you know, a great first um, 
sort of virtual events of the year and everybody's saying how much they enjoyed the slides and you can actually see the slides and your wonderful pictures much better than you can when you're sitting in a lecture hall and you know I think that there was one of the sort of joys of watching your presentation as well there were some fantastic photographs there so you know it's been a real pleasure to to have you around to give this informative and, and interesting talk tonight and yes we are very much looking forward to seeing what's coming out of this and of course for our um, temporary exhibition which we are going to be putting on um, from the uh, results of your research it's got the uh, working title of treasure hoard so do look out and and see what um, comes out of this um, and I think we should also say thank you very much to our very hardworking producer who has been keeping um, an eagle eye on all the comments coming in and keeping us all organised. So thank you ever so much for to Samantha Harris, uh, the collections manager, who is doing her very first uh, produ production uh, role tonight. So I hope you all have a really good night and that you enjoyed it. Uh, as I said, my colleague will be sending out an email um, asking you how you found tonight's event um, and um, you've got an opportunity to feedback there. We will include the link to Sophia's uh, website there on the Bronze Age Hoards. So thank you ever so much and thank you for attending and have a really good evening. Bye bye. <laughs>